for food and flowers and happy hours and love that cares for me. For all the joys of girls and boys, we give our thanks to thee. This was the grace that Mrs. Carrington made the whole school say before we had our lunch. And as you saw, we still remember it. There are some teachers who have left such an impact on their students' lives that long after graduation, these teachers are remembered and cherished. Avisine Avis Carrington is one of those teachers. Unlike a lot of the kids today who don't want to remember our teachers, I think that we remember them fondly because we had a great relationship with them. In the days when I went to Mrs. Carrington, we were in the house. It was before the, the school was built in the back. So we were part of the household. You went into the kitchen. She kind of kept you downstairs, but you would always get away and be part of the house. No nonsense, and she got the job done. Miss Carrington has always been special to us. She was a wonderful teacher. She was, as I was telling Cheryl, when we went into Miss Carrington, it wasn't like going to school. It was going like from your home to another home. And she always made you feel like if you were special. The school was an extension of the Carrington household. Of course, the figure of Avis Carrington uh, towered mightily over the entire school. Um, she was a formidable figure, um, and it was a place where discipline certainly obtained. This guy was first class. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, to remain in teaching for what, 70 plus years, um, to have young children shouting and playing and romping in your ears, you've got to love it. She is. Um, a phenomenal person, and in my opinion, there will never be another like her. Avis left her job of 20 years as a teacher at the St. Giles Boys School to open her own school in her home at number 15 Pine Road, St. Michael. Back then, only six children were enrolled, including her three-year-old son, Ian. What happened really that made me give up my job was my youngest son, Ian. Ronnie and Shelley, they were already at St. Gabriel's at the primary level, and he was the only one at home with a babysitter. So every morning, it would be tears, he would be crying. And out of a blue sky, I said to myself, you know, maybe this is the time when I should make the break from the government system and o open a school with Ian. For Avis, opening a school was quite an adventure, but opening a school in her home while teaching her son was quite an experience for both mother and child. It's a ticklish thing. Uh, I think, and she will deny this, she has her own version of it. I think she was harsher on me than virtually anyone else because I was a reflection of her. And to the extent that I did well or poorly, I think to some extent she saw it as a reflection on her. And perhaps she also wanted to, to make sure that she didn't uh, display any kind of bias toward me. And in my view, she has a different story. But in my view, in an effort to avoid being biased toward me, she went the other way. And I think I got a pretty tough deal sometimes. Ian never left this house to go to school until he went to Harrison's College. So he did not know where school ended and this home started. He was at home. He could not really and truly say to himself, well, you're at school and you have to do what the teacher tells you. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that he actually said that, but that is how I believe it affected him. So why can't he is at home? Why can't he go behind there and jump down, you know, if he wants to? So naturally, 
not only Indy would get a spanking if they broke rules, but he would not, he broke more rules than the others. <laughs> he broke more rules than the others. We had a test, and as always after the test, the students would start to discuss the test and the answers. Well, <clears throat> I realized that I had gotten a number of, I, a lot of the answers I got were wrong, or that I gave were wrong. And it also occurred to me that my mom had not yet marked the test, and the books were in her bedroom. So I thought, why not sneak in there before she actually marks them and make minor adjustments to my answers that would assist me to get a higher score. And I did just that. But I don't think he made a habit of that. Didn't make a habit of that because basically I think my children, although I say it myself, that they, they have a sense of what is right and what is wrong. But he is just a little fella at the time. Avis Carrington was known for her firm but flexible hands-on approach to early childhood education. She wanted her students to enjoy the learning experience at Maryville Preparatory School. I used to like to think of the school as like the United Nations because we had a lot of people from different countries. I, I met people from India, from Africa, from Norway, I remember specifically. And so you got to meet a whole lot of different people and different cultures at the same time outside of, of your, what you'd normally meet in Barbados. So a lot of diplomats' children went there as well. Effectively, the school was her house because we used to have classes in her house. I still think back how she did it. Uh, Miss Applewit, who used to do the ice blocks and the hot dogs, they went in the kitchen for that. Um, her gardens were there. The whole place was just like one big home, quite frankly. And, and looking back on it, there was a lot of love and a lot of warmth. Um, and if you did play the fool, well, you would pay the price. I mean, sometimes you'd get away with it, but that was it. Initially, classes were held in the dining room and on the veranda. But as the school grew, changes had to be made. Strangely enough, <coughs> I never advertised the school. The school advertised itself. People, I support people, support to each other. And for oh, there, well, I will send my little boy or girl there. So that's how the school grew. Children would <coughs> come in on mornings and the chairs were parked outside. We would go and get a chair and bring it in and get ready to work. But after time, that we ran out of floor space. And my husband built that school for me. We, you know, we, we had really reached the stage where we had to do some kind of expansion. Around 1966, my parents realized that uh, because of the growth and the success of the school, that it could no longer be contained in the house. So they actually embarked on a project where they built a school building at the back of the property where my parents live. My father more or less took charge. In fact, in 1967, the family went to the U.S. and Canada on holiday for the summer, but my father remained in Barbados to look after the construction of the school. But it probably took about a year or so. One thing that was a big change, I remember, uh, is that, remember I mentioned we had to convert the living room to a school room uh, and back at the beginning, the end of every week. And at the end of every week, all of the children got involved because there was then a little storeroom <clears throat> on the property where the chairs and the tables were stored on weekends. So the last thing the children had to do on Friday evening was to pick up chairs and tables and move them over to this room. That was actually done by some of the kids them themselves. So I'm sure those children who were there both before and after the school was built were very happy that that chore vanished at the end of the week because with the school building then you had a permanent home and there was no need to be moving the furniture in and out. Along with increased enrollment and building expansion came additional staff. And as for any good business, the selection of workers was critical to the founder's vision and ultimately to Maryville's success. How did you go about choosing your staff? Because, because your style of teaching may have been very revolutionary back in those days. How did you go about choosing people that would execute that vision you had? 
Well, most, practically all of my staff came to me more or less from school. You know, they left school, they were looking for a job and so forth, and they managed to get a place here. So I never put the staff to teach a class. You had to observe what I was doing so that they really and truly had that training. They got to know my methods and my style of, you know, dealing with children and things like that. So I am really happy to say that I had a very good relationship with my staff. That is something I always want to be able to say to people. You know, people say all the time, I hear people say all the time, Miss Karen's in school. But I, I cannot run this school alone. Maryville has been known far and wide across Barbados. But the school has not been run by just one person. And I would like to express my eternal thanks and gratitude to a loyal staff who has served the school for years and stintingly. Mrs. Carrington was an, a well-rounded teacher. You know, you talk about cricketers, may all-rounders, but she was <laughs> an all-rounder. She would help. She would just go around helping in every class because when parents came to the school, they would ask her to speak to Mrs. Carrington. And she would always say, look, I must know whatever is going on in each class. She would always say, don't shout at the children, you know, just, just talk to them, but you must be firm. She never let the children get away with the fact that they couldn't get it done. There was a policy here at Maryvale where, not that you had to do it, but it was done by most teachers. If children during the class session did not understand, we gave of our lunch time to helping that child that was slower in class to achieve what they would have missed. And lot, most of the time it worked. So there was always like an, always you would never pass and don't see a child at Mrs. Carrington's side. One on one side and one on the next. And it's amazing how she can eat her lunch so quickly to get back out to help those slow children or children who didn't grasp the concept that was coming. She was always there to deal with them. And it went through the school because you model what you do from her behavior. But it was the foundation that was laid from the bottom. And reading was a must at my You had to learn to read. And phonics, those basic things that people are now recognizing that they need to pay attention to because, and you would find that there was hardly any child that came from reception class that came through the school that could not read. If that child could not read, it meant that they had a disability, a reading disability, dyslexia or something, but even those children succeeded. Though Maryville Preparatory School can boast of producing Barbados's first female prime minister, Mia Amar Motley, former and present government ministers, scholars, exhibition holders, and many prominent Barbadians. Avis Carrington believes her greatest accomplishment has been helping children considered slow learners to reach their full potential. If I'm a teacher, I have to teach you. I have to make sure that you are familiar with whatever principle I'm putting out there. So I teach. I teach all the time, and I do not believe that it is, you know, to children's advantage to give them past papers all, all the time. I, I just can't figure it out, really. I can't figure it out. So I have always tried to 
make sure that children understand something that I teach. If you don't understand it today, we are going to go back at it tomorrow. So I have, that, that was my method of dealing with the common entrance. And another thing I want to say right here and now, I have never given prizes to common entrance students. I don't mind how many marks, how high your marks are. Everybody at the school, at the end of their time at the school, everybody received a certificate. Everybody got the same thing. You, you, except you have been a teacher and you have been associated with children, you wouldn't realize the damage that is done to children who are now what we call bright. Now you, you have a child here who is academic, very bright. You have a child here who is slow and people calling you, you know, looking down on you and things like that. And now when everything has come to an end, this bright child has all the glory and you are regarded as, well, a failure. So from that point of view, we never gave prizes. We always gave certificates, and everybody had the same certificate. When, when the results come and the tears flow, my tears are flowing too, because, you know, I'm really sorry for that child. These children over here who are bright, they, they, they will land on their feet. And I don't think it is a good thing for children to be relegated as, or oh, you know, they ain't, do, they ain't do anything, they haven't achieved anything. So it's, I, I, I somehow rather, I dislike this top boy and top girl. It doesn't really resonate very well with me. I, I don't believe in top boy and top girl. I believe in a child doing its best. And if your best cannot reach that high level, I, I don't think you should go without um, recognition. And I think that is why a lot of children greet me as they do when, when, when they see me because they know that I care about them and I care about their attainment. And I don't want to make anybody feel like, like a, a, their failures. I, I find that so interesting that you say so when we have a system that really, it does, like you say, reward the, the, yeah. the high flyers. They already have their reward. You know, God has given them that talent. And we naturally enjoy their progress or their successes. But spare a thought to those other children who, you know, always be regarded as failures. And I, I don't think it is good at all for, you know, for their morale. Avis Carrington was also a disciplinarian. She had this little strap that I remember now. It was tattered. It wasn't a f new belt. It was a tattered strap. Um, I can say that I've never been beaten by it, so that was good. Um, but when she spoke, she spoke. And that was it. Um, warm, but firm. That best describes a warm, but firm. And she didn't have to shout. I don't ever remember Miss Karen shouting nothing, so warm, but firm. People responded. She had this strap that was a, a weathered piece of leather that I can still see in my mind. I can still see it right now, I mean, all these years later. Um, oh, everybody did. I mean, that was standard. I mean, <laughs> but, but, I mean, mostly out of love. I mean, I had a little bit of the strap. I mean, mostly boys did. I mean, it was what it was. Uh, I wouldn't say that I was a, um, a 
problem child or anything. But, you know, boys will be boys. A lot of the times the boys got into trouble. We were told to have to sit down through the lunch hour, but you know, we made it through. And I found that Miss Garner was very accommodating. We're realizing that children needed to, you know, a release. And I mean, a positive release, we, we, we skipped, you know, we pitched marbles, we played hopscotch, and boys played with girls. It was, it was no issue. I don't believe in taking a strap and lashing a child, lashing a child. Get them get two or three lashes, and make them realize that they have to really and truly understand what you are trying, the message you are trying to send them. You do not have to be abusive, you don't have to be cruel, but children have to be disciplined. And from that point of view, I think some good slaps have their place. While there were punishments, there were also treats. We had a school bell, which only the persons in the last class, which was class five, could ring. Only those, so it was a privilege when you went to Mrs. Carrington and asked, may I ring the bell? And she'd say, sure. And you ran right up to the top of the school and you rang this bell with such pride. The bell thing on mornings and lunchtime was that you can tell children, they wore watches, of course, and knew the time, and they would gather close to the bell to see who would get it first. But what I noticed about Mrs. Karen, if one person was constantly getting it, she would say, okay, let somebody else do it this morning now. And they rang the bell, both lunchtime and in the time if there was something to be done children would actually volunteer and hold their hands up. They wanted to go. But if you were naughty, she would tell you straight no. Ice blocks. Never thought that you would enjoy ice blocks in foil so much. But we're still talking about it to this day. And she used to make them every day for everybody who wanted them in the school. That is our Mrs. Garrett did. I, I most remember the, the partying and the running about. I mean, we did so much running about at that school, and at that time, we didn't even have a playground. It was, you made it happen wherever it was. In recognition of her service to early childhood education, Avis Carrington was presented with the Silver Crown of Merit in 1994. A government official phoned me and said that there were that they had selected me to receive a, an award. I was totally, totally surprised. I, I didn't really feel that I was really worthy of such recognition. And I felt honored, of course, and when the official spoke, spoke to me, in all humility, I accepted. This country has been fortunate to have Avis Carrington as one, one of our citizens and one of the builders of this nation. Um, when we build a nation, we're not building blocks physically somewhere. We're literally raising a family of citizens. We're raising people. And in her instance, her role in nurturing tens of thousands of Barbadians has been perhaps one of the greatest contributions in the post-independence Barbados and even pre-independence because she started before then in terms of the building out of the Barbadian that we know, the Barbadian that we respect, the Barbadian that we want to be again. And the truth is that she and others like her are the ones who we have to give thanks for. So to that extent, Avis Carrington is one of those giants of Barbados and we owe her a significant debt because she didn't treat it as a job. For her, it was a passion and remains a passion. 50 years after opening Maryville Preparatory School, Avis Carrington decided to close its doors. It was such a sad occasion because I think I mentioned before that it was um, like a big family. And we, the teachers just didn't want to leave Mrs. Carrington or the children. We grew so accustomed to working there. 
it just didn't feel right, but it had to happen at some point in time because the numbers had dwindled significantly. Mm -hmm. So Mrs. Carrington made that decision to close the school. I closed the school after about 50 years, and I was then 90 years old. And it was hard for me to retire. My children didn't let me <laughs> forget that they wanted me to retire. And I could see their point of view. And I realized that the time must come when you know, you have given your service, more or less, to your country, and then you have to sit back and let life go on. Even though Maryville Preparatory is now closed, its legacy lives on through the lives of all those who have passed through its doors and the hands of its founder, Avisine Avis Carrington, one of several principals of Barbadian schools who have helped to shape this nation. You can find more government information by visiting our website, gisbarbados.gov.bb. Like and follow us on these social media platforms under the handle GIS Barbados. And subscribe to our YouTube channel, The BGIS.